So welcome everyone to the first in a new series, uh, Sex and Culture, co-hosting with Raven Connolly. And we are delighted to be joined for the first episode by Warren Farrell and Mary Harrington. I'm going to do, so this will be the first of four films exploring this topic. And this first one, we're looking at a kind of overview of how the media covers the topic of sex and culture and a little bit of a history lesson or a history kind of looking back at how it has covered it since the 60s. And so I can't think of anyone better that we could be joined by than Warren Farrell, because Warren in many ways has lived that history, uh, being one of the first men involved in the women's movement in the 60s, and then being known as the father of the men's movement. So really looking forward to, to hearing what Warren has got to, to share with us. Um, Warren, would you like to say hello to everyone? <laughs> Well, I, I love um, being interviewed by you, David, and I'm looking forward to um, Raven and uh, Mary being part of the process. And and uh, we, we've just you you're always so thoughtful, and you ask good questions, and you listen well. And so, I'm looking forward to giving this overview. Awesome, Raven. Would you like to intro Mary? Uh, yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Raven. Um, I am happy, really excited to introduce Mary Harrington as one of our other panelists. She is a writer for the publication Unheard. She also has a substack called The Reactionary Feminist. And I first heard of her work on Palladium, which is a post-liberal magazine. Mary has her own story of coming of age during the sexual liberation and realizing that the glamour of it wasn't all that it was made out to be. Today, she calls herself a reactionary feminist as a leading voice in breaking the frame around sex, gender, and politics in the hopes of creating more beautiful lives for women, men, and their children. Mary, do you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> Just to say, it's, it's a privilege to be here. Um, Warren, I'm a huge fan, and I actually wrote an essay on your work about 10 years ago when I was training as a psychotherapist at the Minster Centre in Northwest London. There's an integrative psychotherapy course and we did a module there on diversity and we were asked to write something on a voice or a perspective that we thought was underrepresented in psychotherapy. And being the contrarian that I am, I chose men because numerically speaking. Um, I, that's I, just feel, I feel really honoured, Mary. Thank you for letting me know that. That's very nice. So it's it's an absolute privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, I think your 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 countercultural or counterintuitive take on a lot of the dynamics between men and women has has definitely influenced some of the thinking that I've done subsequent to that, and almost yeah. certainly plays into where what the point I've arrived at today, which is really about asking how men men and women can live together rather than um, trying to one up one one up one another all yes. the time. So yes. that's really where my starting point today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. So, so the format of this call will be, there's going to be a four-way dialogue uh, for about the first hour or so, and then we'll shift to a more Q&A open conversation format. So if any questions come up during the, the, the call, if you put them into the chat, if you particularly like a question that someone else asked, plus one it, and we'll come to the, the questions and reflections on the call for about the last half an hour. So as we've already heard, Warren, uh, Mary, you're a, quite a big fan of Warren's work, quite familiar with it. Um, I'd love, Warren, if you could start and just frame this conversation for us a little bit about how you've seen the, the conversation shift around sex and gender, maybe even going back to the 1960s, because I remember you said that when you first got involved with the women's movement, you were advised not to go near it. It was going to be a flash in the pan. It was something that was going to be to affect your credibility. So I'd love to hear that history and then, then how we've got to where we are now in, in as concise a, a way as you can. Sure. Um, I was doing my doctorate in political science and teaching at Rutgers University. And, um, and as the women's movement surfaced in 1969, this is, um, I began to really be excited about it. My mother had not uh, chosen to not go to take a, a, scholarship, a scholarship to Cornell uh, because she thought she wanted to gather together um, clothes and wardrobe to be able to be attracted to, attractive to a man. And, um, and so she made a choice to um, go the marriage route. And she later told me she really regretted that and was very sad that she didn't have any, you know, sort of cultural support to, to, um, to do that differently. And so I got involved with, and so I asked my district, uh, and I mentioned these things to my class at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and they, um, 
and they said, you know, you have fire in your belly when you speak about this, uh, Warren. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, um, you know, why are you doing your dissertation topic on something else? So I approached my dissertation committee and their attitude was, the women's movement, Warren, is just a fad. Uh, you have a, a, a decent future. Uh, why are you spending, why would you spend your, your uh, dissertation uh, writing about a fad that's going to be gone before you finish your dissertation, knowing how slow a writer you are? And I basically said, that's really not going to be, I believe, what happens. It's going to be, uh, it's part of an evolutionary shift. We're going to be able to evolve into more flexible roles. And I'm in favor of a gender liberation movement, which is you know, getting rid of the rigid roles of the past that both women and men were stuck in uh, because we had to focus on survival um, and, and preparing ourselves for more flexible ro roles for the future. And they sort of rolled their eyes and said, okay, and uh, let me do my dissertation on that. That led to me uh, being um, interviewing everything from radical feminists to conservative feminists and uh, the, and leading that led to my being elected to the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, uh, which led to my forming some 300 men's groups and another 200 women's groups as I spoke around the world. And so then I started seeing the women's movement. Um, you know, I think it happened particularly on one day when I was uh, after the divorces were increasing in the 70s. And I saw that um, that that the the combination of the Moynihan report in the 1960s plus the early research about how children were doing who were children of divorce uh, was teaching me that the that when children are without fathers after divorce or when they're born with minimal father involvement to a mother that um, that is not involved with a, a man at that time um, an un unmarried mother for example and that that those children that 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 demographic of children that had minimal father involvement or were what I called dad deprived, that that demographic of children was doing very badly. The clear message that I got was, Warren, you can continue talking about the importance of fathers, but all of your income is coming from feminist referrals. And you're getting about 50 speaking engagements per year. You're speaking at all the major corporations and you're, you're being nominated to be a, a, um, a, one of those um, MacArthur Foundation Genius Awards. You're gonna probably lose all that if we're not sort of supporting you. And I saw the handwriting that was on the wall and I just made a decision to try to do the best that I could to, um, to, to, to go with the research and if the research continue to find that the longitudinal data also showed that boys didn't do well when they didn't have a significant amount of father involvement and neither did girls, by the way, but just less intensely than boys, that I wanted to continue speaking up about that. Such an intense story. Uh, Mary, we're curious. Do you have any questions for Warren and his path to, to where he is now and how his trajectory changed over the course of his life with his involvement in the women's and the men's movement? A question, but really a response, which is um, the, the point that resonates me there, Warren, about what you're saying, and that I think really sort of speaks to the kind of the, the black hole at the heart of at least one particular corner of the women's movement or one or a loose thread in the women's movement I prefer to call it um, which I've been pulling out for some time um, is the question of children um, it seems to me that the central difficult difficulty with um, with feminism conceived of as a project of ever greater freedom is always and always has been actually ever since Mary Wollstonecraft and even before then it's always been children mm -hmm. because there's a there's a point at, because there's fundamentally a point at which um, liberation is in conflict with the the care that you owe to your children and that obviously that go, that that's very literally true when you're gestating and when you're breastfeeding so there's a sense in which you know motherhood of a young child concretizes that in a way which is perhaps less the case for men but I think but in my view it's it's true it's true for both parents and I mean the evidence that you turned up fairly early on in your career speaks to that as well the fact that boys in particular suffer when they're deprived of contact with their fathers. And in fact, all children suffer when they're deprived of contact with both parents. You know, the, the evidence is rock solid. Children do better in an intact two-parent family. And there's, there's there's no way around that. And this is this is something that I think if it, it's something which is in, in acute tension and in a way that's, that's, that's quite sort of difficult to resolve with an account of freedom that says, no, actually, we as women 
want to be autonomous liberal subjects on the same terms as the ideal autonomous liberal male subject, mm -hmm. because in fact I'm I'm sort of coming reluctantly to the conclusion that that's that may be that may not be possible, or at least it's it, it's not possible if you're a parent. At the moment, what I'd love to do is to frame it because this is this is about kind of the media coverage as much as anything, is to ask what is what do you think is missing from the current cultural conversation, the current mainstream liberal conversation around sex and gender. Um, and that maybe is bringing up to date a little bit of that, that history, Warren, that you, that you had from the 1960s. But where, where are we now and what's missing? First of all, the brief answer is it is a disaster. Um, the, um, so example, uh, when, I was on the when I was elected to the board of now, uh, the New York Times approached me and they did a major feature on me. That led to the Phil Donahue show doing multiple, about eight different shows with me. But the moment I started uh, incorporating that compassion for boys and men, all of that went away. Um, and I, I don't mean most of that. I really mean all of that. The exception to that rule was uh, when Fox News and, and other conservative outlets began to uh, 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 pop up. Here, me, this liberal, was suddenly desired by conservative outlets uh, because the conservative outlets heard that I was talking about the importance of fathers. And for the most part, the conservative outlets are also very much aligned with the importance of fathers, the importance of the nuclear family, and so um, and the importance of uh, boys and men um, is something that is very much uh, viable in conservative circles. And so I suddenly became, you know, I'm still a political liberal, and I suddenly became this pariah among liberals and this hero to conservatives. And so it's, uh, but it's left me, you know, overall caught between a rock and a hard place because I'm extremely in favor of gun control and I'm extremely in favor of the, you know, the environment and many, many other liberal uh, issues and causes. Uh, but, um, but here I am um, do, doing stuff that is, um, that is almost always seen almost always by a conservative audience. And so it's, a, it's very fascinating. But the important thing in relation to your point is that the liberal media, and I know, Mary, you'll, you really know this, because uh, uh, will leave you, to use Mary's uh, words, unheard. And not being heard is the single worst thing that you can do to people because it leaves you keep it, especially to males because males already are programmed to not speak up and not to be heard to tough it to tough it out and what what the price of toughing that out is um, is we keep our feelings to ourselves and the, those feelings become deeper and deeper and, and a volcano builds up i would 100 percent agree with that I mean, I, I have a weak spot. For, my, my hobby is internet rabbit holes, right? It always mm. has been. Um, and I've, I've, I spend a certain amount of time lurking, not exactly in the manosphere, but certainly among, you know, at the fringes of the manosphere and places like that. Um, and what I, what I hear coming out of that is resentment, just a simmering, boiling, furious resentment that, in the, main, that the mainstream, certainly among liberal feminists, are, are either oblivious to or contemptuous of. Um, because it's seen as it's seen as reactionary, it's seen as um, it's seen as needless backlash, it's seen as selfish, ugly, contemptible, repulsive, um, selfish, um, just or, or, oriented towards um, putting women back in the box. Um, and certainly, certainly, I have to say, you know, in in some corners of the manosphere, I come out feeling as though I need to take a mental shower because it's just it, it's just not a very nice feeling. Um, but interwoven with all of that, um, well, <laughs> coming at it from another direction, um, there was a study done by the Fawcett Society, which is a pretty mainstream liberal feminist organization based in the UK, um, I think a couple of years ago, where they polled people on, you know, do you identify as a feminist? And among women, barely, not even 10%, I think it was nine and a half percent of women said they identified as a feminist. Um, not even 10%, which is astonishing, really, because it's not its not as though any of us are keen to kind of, you know, relinquish the franchise or go back to being wards of our husbands or fathers or well, <laughs> any of any of the sort of basic women's movement stuff, right? So what's going on? And, you know, there are lots of explanations that are put forward for why women don't identify as feminists, you know, whether is it just ungrateful, ungrateful women, you know, not not realizing the struggles of their foremothers, maybe a little bit, or is it is it, um, you know, what what's going on here? And 
I've, I've come reluctantly, as I think of myself as a feminist, very much so, um, to the conclusion that, in fact, what's going on is that the word feminist has become obnoxious to a majority of the population. And the principal reason for this is that it's been hijacked by an elite class of liberal women who use it to further their own political and economic interests and, and smear anybody who doesn't sign up to those interests, those specific class-based political and economic interests, as agents of the patriarchy. So when I adopted the term reactionary feminist for myself, um, it was in anticipation of being accused of being a reactionary. I thought, well, fine, I'm going to own it then. You know, <laughs> you can call me a reactionary now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. So, but so 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 that so my my take is that actually we we need a class critique of what's going on in in the political in in the political agenda of what 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 gets of the consensus agreement on on what feminism is today. You know, we we need a class critique of that because actually in practice it functions as a Ponzi scheme in which you're you you can be entirely liberated and you can be you can have it all, but only in proportion to how far you up on how far up you are on the socioeconomic scale. So the, the higher up you are, the freer you are, because you can outsource all of those pesky um, ancillary functions like family life to paid employees or, you know. Um, but the further down the socioeconomic scale you go, the more likely you are to be liberated from your children to go and put packets through a barcode reader in a supermarket, which just doesn't sound nearly as appealing as, I don't know, working 60 hours a week in an author. Yes. Or, and so there's a the, 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 there's a there's a invisible class hierarchy in there, and mm. and similarly when it comes to the sexual revolution, there's an invisible in, uh, a disappeared class hierarchy in there, in the sense that hookup culture, you know, there's the studies have suggested that hookup culture is in fact predominantly a middle class phenomenon, and you know, and again the further you are up the socioeconomic scale, the more likely you are to be able to enjoy. And you know, get something emotionally, sexually, physically, you know, in your personal life out of the dissolution of sexual norms. But the further down the socioeconomic scale you go, the more likely that is to result in chaotic lives, multiple children by deadbeat dads, um, you know, a miserable, you know, eking out an existence with four kids by four dads, you know, and and a, and a fly by night partner who beats up your children when you're not looking, you yes. know. And, and it's it's by no means can, it's it's I, it's not obvious to me that that's somehow intrinsically better than a slightly meh marriage to somebody you stop fancying after 10 years. I, I, I just don't see the logic of that. Yeah. So I think the uh, once you apply the axis of class and you apply, you know, the different, the, di the different social, economic and emotional contexts that women live in, you know, at different points in the social hierarchy, I think, you know, what, what women's interests actually are and what they look like is a much more complex and much more textured thing. And this idea that we can roll out a universal program of personal freedom, you know, of the sort that suits very, that, of, that suits well-off, wealthy, um, liberal women, and we can just roll that out as beneficial for everybody. I, I, I find implausible. I think the evidence is well and truly in, and it just doesn't work. So if there's something it. missing from the sex and gender conversation, it's it's partly class. It's partly, as you say, Warren, um, empathy for men, and and you know more fundamentally, stepping right back from that, I think I think there's a the, a, a profoundly missing piece is about intimacy which is to say intimacy, tenderness, compassion, and cooperation between the sexes. The whole domain of relationality is missing. And instead, we found ourselves in this incredibly bitter zero-sum game, which I just do not see ending well. Um, I see it ending in a backlash against feminism and a lot of very lonely, angry, unhappy young men and women. And, and that's really what's coming through for me at the moment. Absolutely. There's so many things that you said that I so agree with. Uh, I noticed Raven and David, you haven't had a chance to say very much um, before I, I, I have multiple levels of response and agreement with Mary. But um, but before I go on, um, do either of you have something to say or um, before I give my perspective? Thanks, Warren. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in. I, I would just say that um, as a young woman, I've never identified with the, lo the label of a feminist. And I think a lot of it has to do with all of these different missing pieces uh, to the feminist narrative that I saw. And I mean, part of it being, I was raised by a very caring father. My mother was a breadwinner and my dad was at home raising me and my brother. Um, so I've always uh, had that kind of healthy, strong relationship with my dad that I think when I came, at, came of age and went to college, it was impossible for me to villainize men. I mean, it, it just literally made no sense to me uh, that this would be the basis of my identity as an outgroup to masculinity and to men when I had such a strong relationship with my own father. And subsequently as well, um, the 
absence of mothering or motherhood or children in the conversation around feminism was also very alienating yeah. to me because that's something that I've always been interested in. I always saw myself as someone who was going to be a mother and there was no instruction or even conversation around that. Instead, the women around me were talking about how they weren't even sure if they were going to have kids. There's this very antinatalist aspect to contemporary feminism. And when I was, you know, defending the position or I was put on the defense of the position of having children. And I just found that to be so, uh, so bizarre. And the, the process that I've gone through has been to be interested in, you know, Camille Paglia is like the only feminist I've ever, I've ever read. Um, and I think that this has actually brought me uh, to Mary in particular, because you actually claim the label feminism. You actually take it and you use it. And uh, I, I'm really interested in why you've maintained connection to that and also what reactionary feminism means to you. Well, uh, the very the shortest answer I can give to that is that it seems clear to me that women as a as a group um, have political interests, you know, and they may vary slightly, you know, depending on your your social or economic context. But I mean, to to look at the United Kingdom, it's not as though women don't get raped. You know, girls, young girls still get shipped abroad to have their vulvas mutilated for religious reasons. You know, domestic violence still happens. You know, postnatal wards are still underfunded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not as though there are no there are no political causes that are related to women being qua, as women qua women. Um, so and, and those are things that I care about. So fundamentally, I see no reason why I shouldn't call myself a feminist. I call myself a reactionary feminist to distinguish myself from the whole progressive program, because fundamentally, I don't believe in progress. I don't think it's a thing. I think it's a story that we tell ourselves. Um, well, I, I could go on for a long time about how and why I lost my faith in progress, but I don't believe in progress. So fundamentally, um, I, I, I want to defend women's interests, but I think it's possible to do that um, outside the paradigm of progressivism. And that, that's, that's my project. I'd love to see yourself relabel slightly. If you keep the feminist label, call yourself a loving feminist. Because that does distinguish you from the great majority of feminists. And it's one mm -hmm. of the things that I think turn many people off to wanting to accept the label of feminism is because they also have inside of them a loving, caring, nurturing part that, wants, that doesn't want to turn men into the enemy. And you don't do that. And so I would not call you um, regressive or reactionary in any way, shape or form. Um, I would call you ironically more progressive than progressives, but I wouldn't ask you to use the name progressive because calling yourself progressive, uh, that's a, that's a self-righteous word. It suggests that anything that anyone that disagrees with you is not progressive. So I think the word progressive and patriotic are both self-righteous terms uh, that that uh, that don't allow an invitation to to um, for people who disagree with you to feel that they can be respected um, in their disagreement. And that part as part of what leads to people being unheard. And we were talking about, you know, David, you were talking about um, Mary and I having in common the, you know, our background. I, I, I do a lot of couples communication training around the, around the country. And the, um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I see with couples is that, you know, when somebody is angry, um, that really pushes off um, the person who might want to hear them. But one of the things that I work with my couples on is understanding that anger is almost always vulnerability's mask. Um, and when you find somebody that's angry, that you usually see somebody that is that has had to keep their feelings to themselves and keep their feelings to themselves, be in your terms, Mary, unheard. And that's a lot of what's happened with the manosphere. Uh, they felt that for a generation or so, uh, that what they felt was just impossible to be heard by, uh, by the media. And so they start building up this enormous anger inside of themselves. And the good news is that when they get together with other men who, who agree with them, a certain amount of that can at least be shared. And, and then oftentimes many of these men, particularly if they're in, in groups of men where they talk this through in, in, in periodic groups, it's not just venting through a, a tweet or a, you know, an angry um, statement, uh, they can work that through and move out of the anger stage uh, once they are heard 
into the more moderate and caring caring stage. And so um, I'd love to uh, I, I'd love for all of us to reframe when we see anger, when we see um, a criminal, a, somebody, a hater, somebody that we feel is just repulsed by, just to ask the question, what's the vulnerability that has made this person hate? And when we, when um, I have people write me emails that are hateful, and I respond back with some dim dimension of respect for what they're saying, the next email usually comes within 20 minutes after I respond. And it's in a much softer way. It was, I, and they, sometimes the words are direct, like, I never thought you'd write me. Um, I so appreciate that. Um, and, you know, and, I, and thank you so much for hearing what I'm saying. And then the next sentences or paragraphs or sometimes pages are just, um, just like a different human being that I've been dealing with. And so I, I'd like to, you know, move toward that approach toward those people with whom we disagree. Uh, rather than the uh, approach that that we um, that we currently have. Yeah, I wanted to to throw something in because um, we're already starting to touch on the sort of shared therapeutic background. Um, some I can't remember where I heard this recently, but I think it I think it may have been Ole Björg, but I'm not sure. Uh, was talking about how this kind of image I think that certain certainly is kind of on the feminist side you have and maybe maybe on the kind of manosphere side as well the idea that well men are happy and women are unhappy and he said well it's it's not really possible for that to be true you can't really have if if one sex is is completely unhappy then the the other sex is likely to be unhappy as well um and i i thought that was kind of quite profoundly put uh, in that way and also this sense of at the time around me too there was there was a kind of the 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 it was often said that now is the time for men to listen for women to speak and I think there's some truth in that there's a lot of voices there were a lot of experiences being shared that maybe hadn't been shared before but by definition that's not a relationship you can't have a relationship where only one side is allowed to speak and the other isn't and I find it very interesting that that has been my experience of training as a counselor and I think learning what more about oneself, also learning more about relationship styles, also helps to illustrate where we're missing each other, where we're not connecting. And I find it very interesting that you both have that shared history in either therapy or relationship counseling. So I guess the question is, what does, what does a healthy relationship look like between men and women? Um, Mary, do you wanna go first? Um, I, I think I'll ask you to speak first, Warren, because you're the one I, you you see a lot more men and women's relationships than me. And then perhaps I can I can resp I mean, I'm, I'm happily married now for 10 years. Um, so I'm, I'm some some way out of the fray on this. Yeah. I imagine you see considerably more of, you know, people's downs than I do. <laughs> well, I suppose I will say yeah. this. One of one of the things I one of the things I think about a lot and something that that's something that I see actually a lot among sort of younger millennials and the, the sort of leading edge of Gen, Gen Z, you call it in America, um, is that people are starting to really wrestle with the question of marriage. You know, what is it for? You know, is it is it is it worth doing? You know, is this something we should take more seriously? You know, I think that I think they look at a lot of the millennials who are aging into you know, a significant subset, something like 40 percent of millennials will never have 30 percent of millennials are single or, or will never will never marry or you know, never have kids. Uh, a far higher number than want to be childless anyway, a, a shocking number. And there's, 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 there's evidence coming out now of a very deep sort of alienation and a very deep unhappiness there. And my sense is that a lot of, a lot of the people who are in their twenties now are looking at that and thinking, I don't want that, but what are the alternatives? You know, if marriage has been so comprehensively traduced and, you know, it's either framed as sort of barely better than prostitution, it's, it's framed as a kind of transactional arrangement, whether that, you know, the incel community talks about marriage as, you know, not much better than women extracting resources from men in exchange for sex, you know, as if, as if that's all that's, if, as if that's the only form of relationship that's possible between a man and a woman. And equally you hear not dissimilar stories story coming from coming from people within the feminist community who say who, who treat it as a, as a patriarchal arrangement where women were compelled to exchange resort exchange sex for resources and care and you know the stories are the stories are startlingly similar and I look at it and I think now that's actually not what it's like or at least that's not my experience of being married my experience of married is being married is it's more like the only the only sort of communism I can ever imagine working 
you know, where you where you do have a kind of radical this radical agreement to just hold everything in common. Yeah. And there's something there's something there that's so outside the contemporary paradigm of framing everything as an exchange and everything as a transaction and everything as something which can be leveraged and monetized and that everything that has to be fungible, everything yeah. has to be it has to be possible to liquefy anything, you know, at a moment's notice and go back to being a soul, an alone person, a sole person again. And the idea that you might commit in perpetuity to to something which limits that um, that 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 state of freedom, which is either a neg- it, well, it's a it, it's a kind of it, it's a kind of negative freedom, or it's a it's a very lonely form of freedom anyway. Um, and then the idea that you might commit to something which limits that freedom is sort of horrifying. But I, I, my sense is that for a, for a lot of people who are seeing, you know, lonely people sliding into middle age now is actually also very appealing. But one of the challenges that I see with that is that there aren't very many people who are willing to talk about what it's like mar- navigating a marriage in the 21st century, because the people who are the people who are willing to talk openly about it are, have happy marriages. <laughs> and the people who've ever wrestled with that in a in a more challenging way, it's well, it's put it, it's not really fair on your spouse to say, well, you know, we went through this really grim five years where we just barely spoke to each other and it was horrible. <laughs> and you can't really, you can't. It's 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 very rare to find a couple where both people have agreed to talk to to, to talk about that. And it's not really fair on your spouse to share that stuff because it, it it's really you know it doesn't get more intimate than that. Yeah. So you know, but perhaps perhaps it's incumbent on people like you, Warren, who who meet a lot of. The, the the messier side and can talk about it in more generalities to say well you know these are these are some things which I see people wrestling with and these are the ways I see people surviving um, and these are these are the ways I see people dealing with it um, I don't I don't know what the answer is but I feel like we need to talk more about about what what the bigger picture of what marriage looks like and you know not not just the stories of people who've divorced and walked away and are like, oh, yeah, if it's gone wrong, you should walk away. And not just the stories of smug married, you know, the very, very rare smug couples for whom there were never any problems, yes. <laughs> which I'm sure must exist somewhere. But, you know, the but, but but a bit more of the messy reality of what it's actually like navigating life in common, which, you know, let's face it, does have it, it has it comes with challenges. It can't. How could it not? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think what got me into um, doing couples communication workshops was that um, I began to see that there was an Achilles heel that almost every human being has. And that you and this is male and female human beings, which is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive, especially if that criticism is given badly. And almost always anyone who believes that they're being criticized feels that that whatever method the person used to criticize them, it was given badly. So that's sort of like a done deal. Um, and so I started saying, well, what's that about? And I realized that historically speaking, if you were hearing criticism and you were in a tribe or a kinship network, potentially that criticism signaled to you that there was an enemy. And it was functional for you to get up your defenses to um, to against the possible enemy or even to kill the enemy before the enemy killed you. Um, and so in order to survive, we had to be defensive or aggressive with someone who was critical of us. Um, but for and that was great for survival. It was just terrible for love because it prevented your partner from being able to share her his concerns without feeling like the, there was such a risk of, um, of you becoming, of, of, of the person hearing the concerns becoming defensive and then attacking them back. And so another part of the, the workshop, that, that I, the couples communication workshops I do, is learning how to do a, um, um, a, a conflict-free zone for 166 hours a week, learning how to maintain that conflict-free zone when sarcasms or negativities or criticisms um, come up during the week. So it's a complex process of basically um, taking, it's, it takes about a 10-hour course to redo your evolutionary um, propensity to, uh, to be uh, def- uh, defensive uh, when, when you're criticized. We, we've run on a little bit from when we were going to go to the questions from the audience. So I'd love to invite everyone to turn on their, their cameras if they'd like to. And we have a, a few questions. We've got a, quite a few questions about Mary's scepticism of progress that I think would be very interesting to go into, but maybe maybe in a, uh, maybe in not the first one. Um, there was a question that um, I... I'm not sure your first name, TM Capstick. 
You'll have to unmute yourself and let me know it's, your name. It's Tracy, and one day I will change the title on the screen. No worries. <laughs> so, Tracy, would you like to, to ask your question? So, so the question to the panel was, there's gen generally some degree of outcry uh, about misogyny. Um, but there's very rarely um, any articles, discussions or openness about its female counterpart. Um, so I'd kind of what are your thoughts about the the, the lack of um, the, the lack of time and energy given to um, misandric behaviors? It just doesn't appear to to, to be um, part of any discussion, actually seems to be acceptable yes it is first of all um it's an extremely important question and until and illustrating your point until a few years ago the, the merriam webster's dictionary didn't even have the word misandry in it mm -hmm. and it is it is one of those things it's like where the fish in the fish is the last one to know it's swimming in water um and so you know would it be considered misogynist for for example if only women in the United States were drafted, were subject to the, the female only draft and men were protected from the female only draft, um, would it be considered an ultimate example of um, misogyny? But the exact reverse is true. Um, there's a male only draft registration. And if your son doesn't pay, uh, if your son doesn't sign up for a male only draft possibility, um, he's, he um, is subject to um, years in jail is subject to a quarter of a million dollar fine. He is never able to go to a college that gets any federal money, which is virtually every college in the United States. Um, he is not able to get in 42 states, he cannot get a license um, and a driver's license. And so you get a sense of, you know, if this were reversed, this would be considered um, a clear example of mis uh, misogyny, um, but it is not because we can't see it. It's th we're that blind to we're like the fish swimming in water, not even knowing that it's in water because it's it's this is the natural state of things uh, for this. The um, the most recent example is a couple of weeks ago, um, President Biden for, uh, signed the executive order for a White House Gender Policy Council, a White House Gender Policy Council that was focused only on women's issues and girls' issues, but not on boys' issues, not on men's issues, not on um, father's issues. Completely blind to the, uh, and if this was reversed and we had an administration, let's say the Trump administration had created a, um, you know, a gender policy council and focused only on men's, boys, and father's issues and not on women and girls' issues, the outcry of misogyny would be all over the place. But it, but we are completely blind to it. I'm, un, I'm unaware of anyone in the United States who has, who has been able to get the media's attention, um, except for myself and only on conservative channels, uh, to speak out about the sexism and the racism. And let me just spe spend a minute on the racism of it. Um, the there's when you're when we have misandry that is the hating of men and the ignoring of men's and boys issues we invariably also not just being sexist we're also being racist so for example in the united states the people the by far and away the the biggest group of people who are having problems are black males Black males are far more likely to be in prison. They're far more likely to be street homeless. Uh, they're far more likely to be um, uh, graduating from high school, to be uh, educated, to more likely to be drug addicts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the police um, are 25 times as likely to shoot a black male as they are a black female. And so when you ignore, and, and the single biggest um, cause of black males' problems is fatherlessness. And so boys, men, and fathers being ignored is significantly hurting the black male, but we only see it from a race perspective, but the other half of black male is male. And if we reverse this and we ignored black females who are doing much better than black males, uh, we would even, though they are doing better, we would call that misog misogyny, but we don't even hear the word misandry we don't, we don't suggest that anyone who doesn't hear 
um, that black males are having problems is not just sexist, but also racist. And so um, um, uh, T, Tracy, I think it is, um, your, your point is extremely um, accurate and valid. And, you know, and then I guess the deeper question behind it is why is this? And the brief answer to why it is, I believe, is that historically and biologically, uh, men were trained to be disposable. Being attached to your young boy, we're trained to be disposable in war or dis uh, trained to be disposable as, as a, uh, in, in the old days um, as a sole breadwinner. And so we learned to earn money that somebody else spent while we died sooner or alternatively go to that nation's war when, when we were 18, 17 years of age. And the result of that is we have not had the emotional attack. You can't attach emotionally to someone you might lose. You cannot also, there's something else going on there, which is that the role biologically of boys and men was to be willing to die in order to be loved, in order to reproduce, in order to be honored by other men. So all the incentives were to not pay attention to men's feelings and fears, but rather to train men to repress their feelings and their fears so that they would be willing and able to save women, to save children, to save other males aside from those that are losing their lives. And so that's what's running deep. That's the deep biology of it. And that's what we're confronting. And that's why challenging these things is a very slow process when you are trying to protect males because the very purpose of men historically and biologically was not to be protected. It was to protect and die in the process. And that's the way we got love. That's the way we got respect. That's what the, our, um, our medals of honor were for. Mary, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, Thank I mean, the, two two very brief points, um, so we so we've got time for some other questions. Um, one is that um, I find it, I I get quite frustrated with reducing the 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 discourse between men and women to a question of misogyny or misandry, as though as though it has to be a zero sum game. Um, I mean, it's 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 clear to me that it's it's possible to hate men. I've met I've met plenty of women who hate men. You know, I, I've probably I've been through phases in my own life of hating men. Um, sometimes women hate men with good reason, um, or they hate men because they've had a horrible experience with some men, which has left them left them with 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 that as a general model for what men are like. You know, these are big people. Some people have some terrible experiences, but it it seems to me that you know, as a as a general cultural condition of you know the way the way we relate to one another, this 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 is not functional. Um, and I and, and I I certainly agree with the I. With with the implication, Tracy, in your question, that you know, either we need to talk equally about misogyny and misandry, or my preferred solution would be that we we can find a way of moving beyond a, a kind of tit for tat business of of hating one another, and try and try and find a way of understanding one another better. And so the second point um, to to Warren's to Warren's very interesting um, account of you know male socialization and male biology. Um, it's some, something that I wonder about a lot is the extent to which men would like to have that back and how much men really like the modern world where none of that really applies anymore. I don't really know the answer to that, but I, I get the impression from some men at least that they wouldn't mind going back to being uh, to, to something a bit more like the old fashioned patriarchal role. And they wouldn't mind having to emote a bit less and provide a bit more and perhaps perhaps lead slightly more dangerous lives if only people would would take some of this other bullshit away. Um, I mean, that's that's certainly not universally the case, but it, it's a sentiment that I come across sometimes. And, and I, I wonder about I wonder about how far it's possible or even plausible or even desirable to try and quote unquote evolve beyond that. Yeah, expressing your feelings is pushing men out of their comfort zone. Um, but if you started at first, second grade, having men be um, socialized to talk about their feelings, be honored for it. Men will do whatever we are honored for doing, whatever we are respected for doing, and whatever we are loved for doing. And when we when we are loved, respected, and honored for doing uh, well, you saw this with the Vikings. Um, you know they were the you know the most fierce, um, you know, destructive, 
horrific uh, destroyers of life. And then um, the war ended and many of those Viking males ended up marrying and raising children um, with, um, with um, women in the UK and, um, and being much more uh, you know, not vicious uh, and so on. The ability of men and girls and women to make changes in one generation between what they were honored for um, versus what they uh, what they you know would have been considered a wimp if they were unwilling to be a to go to war to be as a Viking, and then the next generation if they started using um, you know slaughtering everybody in the family, uh, they would have been um, dishonored completely. And so uh, this this is this gives you you know enormous understanding of the ability of people to change uh, that part of our biology. Is our willing is is this, is our responsiveness to the social bribes that can be used either negatively or positively of being honored, respected, and loved. I think I dare say there's some truth in what you say, Warren. Although I'm just going to going back to the quest, the 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 story of the Vikings. I would I would give a slightly different account of that that particular set of uh, historical events. In that Vikings were actually the original incels. You know, they were the spare males in their own country. Mm -hmm. And the reason they set out reaving across the sea was because the, 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 there, was, there was not enough land, there were not enough wives to go around, bluntly. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they set off looking for somewhere to settle and somewhere to marry and basically somewhere, somewhere else to live. And obviously, you know, when they when they arrived in in you know the far north of Scotland or wherever it was that they landed down the east coast of the United of uh, what's of the British Isles, you know, the dudes who were already living there were like, no, you can't have our women. And so there was a massive fight. And you know, the Vikings being nails won to a great extent. And then they settled down and married the women there. Job done. So, you know, I'm not completely convinced that your account of, you know, them them having a war and then settling down and being rewarded for different stuff and, and being being nice after that is is exactly how I would see it. Um, I would see it more as they, they got what they were looking for, which was more land, more resources and, and some some women to marry. And therefore, they stopped hitting people. Interesting. Uh, Mary, would you send me something on that that you think? I will. Um, I will. Of that? Thank you. That's very nice. Great. Cool. We have. Um... We're kind of into the five to seven minute uh, range here. So before we close out, I'd like to turn to Eli's question for Mary about progress. So Eli, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not really sure how to ask this in a specific way that could be wrapped up in five to seven minutes. I think Mary said, you know, she could speak for hours on it and I would love to hear that at some point. But I just think this, this notion that progress is an illusion that we that we happen to uh, believe in maybe because of the time that we're born into is fascinating and I think it has all kinds of implications like down to things like you know are we going to be able to like we just imagine we're going to be able to eliminate crime or or racism or something like that and the idea that that there's no progress that can happen I mean I, I at times I've 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 seen the point but anyway I'm rambling I'd love to hear more about it Mary um, well, it, it, it's not to say that things, it's not to say that I don't believe things ever get better or things ever get worse. It's more that I think, you know, what, whatever it is that changes in a society generally comes with plus points and minus points. It generally comes with trade-offs. And if we're telling ourselves a story about progress, it's generally mostly because we're ignoring the trade-offs. You know, we're ignoring whatever the downsides are of, of the things which have got better. Let me see if I can think of a concrete example of that. Well, feminism. Um, well, I mean, yes, <laughs> frankly. Um, but I mean, you know, it, it's uh, and I think I mean my my take on feminism is that you know in in each of the in, in you know throughout its history it's been a rational response to to situations which were less than which to to circumstances which were less than ideal. You know, I mean, the the beginning of the industrial era was actually a point where sex roles became more pronounced and women's autonomy reduced but just because the the nature of the economy and the nature of work changed and where in an agrarian me medieval civilization you know most families would have worked in households so women women would have done some work whether that was artisan work or caring for children or looking or, or growing food or whatever and and men would have done some some artisan work and been around but the but the household was the productive unit um, and and childcare was an interwoven with that you know in a sort of in a fairly large and kind of complex um, social unit but then of course when the industrial era came along the work is suddenly something which takes not suddenly but great increasingly something which takes place outside the home and is and and so the home became something which was conceived of as private 
and women, you know, particularly bourgeois women, increasingly became a group who it was it was considered as a, a social status symbol. If your wife didn't have to work, because that meant you earned enough money, you did something for a living, which meant your wife didn't have to work. And women rationalised that in a bunch of different ways. But the two, the sort of principal cleavage was between women who were like, well, no, actually, we don't like this because we don't have any autonomy, and we want the vote, and we want we want to live in public life on the same terms as men. And and that and that that's really the birthplace of liberal feminism. And then there was another set of women who were like, no, actually, this is fine. You know, we'll be the guardians of you know moral values and the private sphere, and we'll look after children, and we'll do all of that. And you know, and that's really the birthplace of that. That's really where we we ended up with, I suppose, the sort of conservative account of of sex roles and women's roles and so on. And there's there's this incredibly complicated interaction between these two sort of basic rationalizations of the public private economic split in industrial society, but fundamentally they're both responding to the same stuff and they're both trying to make sense of it in different ways. Um, you know, and, that, and that's and tracing tracing the contours of that, those economic shifts and those sort of cultural rationalizations of that, you know, which are really just a story of men and women trying to find a way of living together, which accords both parties and families mutual respect in a way which is sort of broadly socially functional at the, at the large scale. Um, you, it is really it's an alternative as kind of counterintuitive way of looking at the entire history of feminism. And to me, it's fundamentally much more plausible than it is looking looking at the story of feminism as being a linear one of moralized linear story of progress, you know, from this point, low point down here where things were bad to this much higher point up here where things are suddenly morally in some absolute sense much better. And I, you know, I see that history of feminism as being, you know, it's a sort of dynamic evolutionary progress, a dynamic process of people responding to you know large large and small scale developments in you know how we interact with one another and just trying trying to make things work um, and not 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 being not something intrinsically moral in in any sort of absolute sense at all you know and, and and it's my it's very much my view that we're reaching the end of the industrial era and one of the big questions that i have that i really don't know the answer to is you know what what the settlement between men and women is going to look like you know as we as we step into the fourth industrial revolution and that that really i think is a fundamental question for for the women's movement now and which is really not being asked at the moment you know how do we engage with tech you know how do we engage with with questions questions of transhumanism you know questions of you know divorcing reproduction from the human body you know how do how do we engage with you know the whole the whole realm of sort of cyborg technology which is just infinitely closer to being a reality than it was 20 years ago you know is that is that compatible with feminism is that is is that compatible with women's interests i should say or, you know, or, or is it in conflict with them you know we don't know the answers to any of these questions and i feel like they should be being asked in a much blunter and more mainstream way you know and, and with the interests of ordinary women in mind not just the not not just the elite ones who who have the ability to um out, you know to to offset any externalities you know because they just have the resources to get around that stuff i don't know if that speaks to your your question Eli. okay if i added something to that it would be basically that i think that it is always almost always we are we are moving toward progress and all that progress comes with trade-offs and um and and there's almost and the femi feminism is a really good example of that you know um, it's very difficult to say that we want children to no longer uh, if they're female uh, to not be able to aspire to politi uh, political economic um, progress um, and at the same time um, we see that uh, the people who believe that have demonized men, demonized um, boys, uh, demon and you know de um, neglected fathers, and undermined their own ability to have the support of fathers, as even as they're single mothers and overwhelmed, uh, which is the most single, which is the single biggest word that um, single mothers use is the word overwhelmed. Um, and here are these men who are fathers who are wanting to be more involved and they're feeling left out. So we have this perfect lose-lose situation of left out men, um, un unsupported women and demonized men um, and no, no understanding that the ability um, calling things male privilege when men were spending their, their, their lives being willing to die for women. Um, and then that's male privilege. I don't think so. And so 
and then the people who uh, agree with that sort of dichotomized ver uh, version of women oppressed and men the oppressors, they start gender studies courses. And those gender studies courses <laughs> do not allow any of the perspective of boys and men. And then the people who are doing the gender studies courses are making their income and their living from that perspective. And it's extremely difficult to communicate with them. And the people who are journalists have moved through courses that have that perspective. And so they don't allow for any other discussion on this issue, even as they call themselves progressive. Um, so I think that, and yet we are right here in Zoom mode, um, talking nation, you know, across nations, uh, having a discussion about where do we go from here, which is an enormous amount of progress. Uh, that, you know, uh, and so we have this, we have pr progress and trade-offs always interacting with each other uh, throughout all of history. I think one of the best people to explain this well, especially the progress part of it, is Steven Pinker, who um, you know the, our better angels and looking at um, how we, when we get depressed with where we're going and how we how far we've come to look at what we were like in the past. It's pretty, it's pretty both depressing to see how we were historically, and also um, it makes you smile to see that for all the challenges that we have, uh, the very freedom to be able to discuss these things like we are doing is not just a function of democracy and a free world, it's also a function of Zoom technology um, and the freedom to not be so preoccupied with survival that we, in the middle class and upper middle class in developed nations can have a discussion about what the trade-offs are and what really is progress. And that is truly, that is truly progress. Awesome. So we are just over time. There's been a few requests for an after hours meetup, which we aren't able to have in here, unfortunately, because we're hosting the last Sense Making 101 course in about 25 minutes in here. But we've just put a new link into the chat. So you're welcome to, to copy and paste that after this meeting ends. So before I say thank you to Warren and Mary, Raven, did you have any, any thoughts, wrap up thoughts before we go? Yeah. What I appreciate about both of you is that you both break the frame in the way that you approach these questions. You're going outside of like the bumpers that are kind of constructed for all of us to see these problems within. And you both do it in your own unique ways. And I think that the synergy between these two perspectives and also working through these very tricky questions. I mean, the question of nurture versus nature has been with us for a very long time and it still persists as um, a dichotomy that exists within our political conversations, as well as the emphasis on uh, on the things that are missing in this trade-off landscape. We're focusing on some very specific things and we're leaving all of these other things in the shadow. And I think both of you are turning the light to the shadow. And in order for us to, I think, progress in the way in which, Warren, you're speaking about, we have to think about the whole. And that means recognizing the trade-offs. And I think both of you are doing that in your own ways. And I think you contribute so much to the conversation. And I, I'm really grateful to have both of you here. And thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to echo that. Uh, Warren, ever since we met you in California, I think three years ago, like that was one of our favorite interviews and favorite meetings of the whole time we were there. I really I really love the presence, the energy that you bring and the, the integrity that you bring to this conversation. So uh, thank you for, for joining us. And Mary, uh, yeah, really nice to meet you very recently, but there's been an awful lot of love for you in the chat and uh, a request to get you back on Rebel Wisdom to, to talk again soon. So I hope that you'll consider coming back and Warren as well, of course, Thank coming you. back at some point in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I may say, if, if somebody is um, wants to dig into some of these things more deeply um, in terms of the nature versus nurture issue, um, to if, if in the Boy Crisis book, spend time on the chapters be, of the differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting and get a real sense as to why children do so much better with what I call checks and balance parenting. And then on the family level, take a real careful look um, at the appendix on how to set up a family dinner night without it becoming a family dinner nightmare. Um, the following the rules to that has led to so many families having their children instead of rebel uh, really feel heard and adults who usually feel 
disconnected from really feeling heard. And so if you want to get into the, the communications issue more quickly than the my Zoom course comes out, um, dig into that um, and work with that with your family and let me know uh, what the results are. Um, my, my email is warren at warrenferrell.com. And um, I, and that's and I will that's my only email. I respond to every email I get. Warren at warrenferrell.com. Awesome. So thank you so much to Raven, to Warren, to Mary, and to all of the questions. So as we traditionally do, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and say goodbye, we will uh, see you again very soon. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions, where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. Also, Rebel Wisdom will be at the Inner State Festival in Albania in September, so check out the link below for details. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.